Hello, everybody. Welcome to the History Valley Podcast with your host, Jacob Berman, as usual. And today we are joined once again by Dr. David Litwa. And today we're going to be focusing on the development of early Gnosticism. The Gnostics believe that Jesus is the son, of, he is the son of a higher being that some of them call the monad or aeon or the one, and that Yahweh is actually the devil, um, Yaldabaoth. And uh, Dr. Litwa has discussed this extensively in his book, The, uh, the Development of the Evil Creator. And I'll have the link in the description below. So if you guys want to go check that out. Um, okay. So let's get started on this question. What do you think led Marcion to conclude that Jesus Christ was the son of a higher being, a higher God greater than Yahweh, and that Yahweh was in fact the devil Satan himself? Well, uh, it's a great question and just a belated thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Um, I'm, yeah, very excited uh, and jazzed about this particular material. It's what I'm currently working on. It's very fun stuff. But the thing um, about Gnostic and particularly Gnostic Christian thought to keep in mind is it's, it's quite a complex thing. So maybe I should just give a very, very brief history lesson here because you ask about Marcion and Marcion typically isn't categorized as uh, Gnostic. So we wanna be careful what we're actually talking about. One of the key characteristics of Gnostic and specifically Gnostic Christian thought is what I call and excuse the fancy term, but negative demiurgy, which simply means it's the view that the creator of this world is evil. And, and it usually goes along with the idea that the creator isn't the true deity. He's some kind of sort of lower being. He exists, um, but is malevolent and arrogant and self-centered and very misleadingly declares himself to be a deity. As we see in Isaiah, I, I alone am he, I am God, there is no one but me. And that's just not true. <laughs> and hmm. one of the reasons that the Old Testament deity so vigorously insists on being alone is because he's not, and he knows he's not. But like any dictator or tyrant, you just keep repeating the hmm. lie and a mass of people will believe it. So that's one component of Gnostic thought, negative demiurgy, but it's not the only component. So there's also other, other components that go into it. And those usually include any, any number of things. And here's where some people and many scholars genuinely disagree about well, what are we, what's an essential feature? And basically most of us are fairly well convinced there's, there's no real essential feature, but there's a family resemblance, uh, a cluster of features that have a family resemblance. And so this might include a mythological story which involves the revelation of the true deity and tells the, about the fall of wisdom and about the origin of the creator from wisdom. Um, sometimes that's involved, but sometimes not. And uh, it's sometimes combined with ascetic behavior uh, that is, you know, rejecting certain, uh, abstaining from certain things like sexuality uh, or uh, meat and wine. Um, and this involves a sort of attitude of transgressiveness, where you want to oppose the creator so you don't use certain things, so on and so forth. So along that trajectory, Marcion is, is definitely, he's definitely there, and he's definitely early. 
And in fact, I think that he's earlier than most people who get to be called Gnostics. And I'm one of those scholars who don't actually really like overusing this term Gnostic. I prefer to be much more specific because we, we can be much more specific. There are Marcionites, there are Sethians, there are Nassines, there are Valentinians, there are Vesladeans, and these are all different Christian groups who are all have different ideologies, okay? And some of these groups called themselves Gnostics, like the Carpocratians, for instance, but they didn't mean that as a technical term that is, a, you know, as like the main designating specific title that we use for our group. By Gnostic, they just simply meant knowers. And that's really what all that the term uh, meant uh, originally. So it, it's those who know. So getting back to your question, why theologically would Marcion, who was very early, working in 120s, 130s, why would he conclude that the creator of this world was evil? Well, the point of my book, The Evil Creator, the real emphasis is to show that all that Marcion really needed was the Bible itself. And for Marcion, that Bible was quite restricted, okay? So for Marcion, he only had or only recognized one single gospel, and he only recognized 10 letters of Paul. And so in, in modern canons, there's 13, and plus Hebrews, plus the Catholic epistles, plus the book of Revelation, plus three other gospels. So Marcion's canon is, is, only, is only very restricted. It's only got 11 documents in it. And in addition to that, Marcion paid attention to the Hebrew scriptures. Now, Marcion never viewed the Hebrew scriptures as his Bible, but he did use it to expose the character of the creator. So as it, as it were, you want to do an, an analysis of the Judean creator, your best reference work is this, these books, 22 books of the Hebrew Bible, okay? And that's what he uses. And what he finds there is a God in Genesis who is threatened by Adam and Eve, prevents them from knowing things, and is threatened when they do eat from the tree of knowledge, and kicks them out of Eden, uh, introduces a great flood to wipe out human beings, all of them, and does other things. Uh, Elisha and the she-bears, for instance, Elisha is made fun of by a group of 40 young boys. He then calls upon the creator to curse the boys. The creator then sends two she-bears who devour the boys in an extremely violent massacre. The creator commands genocide of the Canaanites and is a, a war god. And as the character of the, an autocrat and is always boasting about his own power and glory and doesn't mind manifesting that power and glory when other humans die and is in fact willing to kill other humans in order to advance his power and glory. So basically that is the character analysis of a tyrant or a dictator, a modern autocrat, something that you would see today coming out of, I don't know, modern autocratic nations, just as we see in Russia, okay, recently with the Ukrainian invasion yesterday. So they just do what they want. They advance their own glory, their own national glory and pride, and they don't care about the human cost. Okay, there's, that's not as important to them. They want to rule the world. Yahweh wants to rule the world. 
Really, he just rules this very, very, very tiny nation on the corner of the Roman Empire. And everyone simply laughs <laughs> about his claims to absolute sovereignty. He was never a universal god. He was always local. He was always played a game of favoritism for his own distinct people. He always encouraged them to have wars. And in Marcin's time, they almost all lost almost always lost. So in addition to that, when Marcin read his gospel, which was, we think, an early form of Luke, prior to its revision in the mid-second century, he read about Jesus coming forth and preaching a completely different kind of, of deity, a deity who loves people, a deity who comes to save everyone. It is not solely focused on the Jews. A deity who preaches the forgiveness to enemies, the turning of the cheek, help to those who are poor and impoverished, and is interested in creating a just society for everyone. So the profile of Jesus as God doesn't fit the profile of the Hebrew or what we might call Judaic deity or that being who claims to be a deity. And that is where Marcion got his information. When you look at this situation in which Yahweh is demoted as a lower being and he is basically the son of a higher god, does that remind you of the pre-monotheistic um, atmosphere uh, that used to exist in ancient Israel when El used to be understood as Yahweh's father? Uh, well, I would slightly revise the question in that during Morrison's time, even that thing we call monotheism didn't didn't exist. So I'm not I'm not accepting monotheism for this period. They hmm. they all believed in multiple divine beings, and even strict Jews would agree on occasion that. You had exalted angels like Metatron and exalted patriarchs like Jacob and deified patriarchs like Moses. So the idea of there being a, an absolutely single God mathematically is not the case for this period. They did claim that God, their God had most of the power. And that's really all that, you know, oneness meant at this period. It just, he's the guy with the most power. Uh, so, I mean, the short answer to your, your question is, yeah, these traditions of Yahweh not being supreme, of being local, of being particular, and of being something less than another deity, possibly, maybe they, maybe they survive. But I think the important thing for Marcin is, is Marcin grows up very far from Phoenicia. He's not Phoenician. He's not, um, he's not Middle Eastern. He's from Pontus. So he's, he's in Turkey. He's North Turkey, right south of the Black Sea. Okay, so where he grows up, he's probably not familiar with much Jewish tradition at all. At least he shows no love or loyalty to the Jewish creator. So he definitely wouldn't agree that he ever demoted the Judean deity because for him, the Judean deity is just like, I don't know, an African deity to us. Like we never demoted an African deity, but we never saw an African deity as the true universal God either. So maybe certain African nations want to claim that their own particular deity is the universal God, but since we didn't grow up there, we're not familiar with that, 
who cares? I mean, that sort of attitude is, to my mind, something closer to the to what Marcion had. Could Revelation twenty two sixteen, which makes Jesus out to be the son of Lucifer and David, be the result of Jesus' links to insurrectionists, insurrectionists in his time? And thus he was made out to be a rebel comparable to Lucifer by the author of Revelation. And could it have influenced the early Gnostics in believing that Yahweh is the devil Lucifer? Well, I'm glad that you asked this question because it, it gives me an opportunity to talk about the sort of historical groundwork that needs to be laid before you approach something like this. So the most important thing for your viewers to know about Revelation is that despite its popularity today, this document was not viewed as authoritative widely in the early second century, okay? And in fact, in the Eastern among Eastern Christians, it really took until the fourth century for this document to be accepted. And we certainly know that for Marcion and for most of his companions among second century Christian theologians, they show absolutely no attention to the book of Revelation because it's not authoritative. And frankly, it's not even on their radar. So to say that the Book of Revelation was influential for negative demiurgy would just be a, a historical error. In the second century, the Book of Revelation hardly has any authority at all. And we don't know how widely read it was. So yes, it's true that uh, you have in 2216 a case where Jesus claims to be the morning star, which is an odd claim in light of Isaiah, where the morning star is, or Lucifer is uh, the devil. But as far as I know, there's no second century or even third or fourth century evidence that that was important for the view that the creator was evil. Could the two censuses of David in the Old Testament with one version claiming that Satan was responsible for it and the other version saying God was responsible for it played a part in the identification of Satan with God by the early Gnostics? Yes, this is the kind of story which early Christians like Marcion and like his disciple Apelles would pay attention to. And we have a evidence for Marcion tackling a number of passages from the Old Testament like this. But as far as my knowledge goes at the moment, this particular passage is not mentioned by Marcion. Now this could have been mentioned by Apelles, and Apelles is, is just as important as Marcion. Apelles is Marcion's disciple, and Apelles writes a, at least a 38 volume work called Syllogisms, criticizing episodes in what we call the Old Testament. And so, unfortunately, this work doesn't survive, but my money is that, yes, he would definitely have noticed that, uh, what you're referring to is that in, in the books of Kings, uh, there is God inciting David to have a census in, the, in Chronicles, which is later they're trying to clean this up and hmm. say that it's actually actually Satan. So it's, a, it's an apologetic move, okay? And, but when Kings and Chronicles were all bound together as one Old Testament, Yes, absolutely. These are the kinds of contradictions that early Christians like Marcin and Apelles would have noticed. In this case, we simply don't have strong evidence. And 
uh, that's quite unfortunate <laughs> from hmm. my point of view. Yeah. No. But, but you're on the right track and you're thinking exactly like they would. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Do you think the author of John's Gospel could be a potential, not necessarily Gnostic, but Gnostic like? because he believes that the Israelites are the descendants of Cain, as per John 8.4.4, or, or, or somewhat alludes to that because he says that the, they are the sons of their father of a devil who was a murderer from the beginning. And of course, he, the, that's the, that he makes the devil out to be the father, their father, as I was just saying. Could that also play out in identifying God with Satan because he says that the devil, the, the devil's people are the Israelites, but in another text, he says, oh, it's actually God's people too. Yes, definitely. The Gospel of John is important for early thinkers, not for Marcion, for the obvious reason that he doesn't accept John as authoritative, but certainly other Christians like Valentinians and Sethians did read the Gospel of John. And I've got both an article and a chapter on the in the book the evil creator on John 8, 44. As you correctly know, it's probably not wise to say that John is Gnostic because it's not, uh, it's not really negative demiurgy, right? Because in, yeah. in John's prologue, it's the word who creates the world and the word is a positive being. Uh, this word is logos in the greek so it's the, it's the logos who creates the world which is an interesting statement in itself because it's not the judean deity who creates the world it's actually another being another subordinate divine being called the logos but we can talk more about that at some other time but for for john 8 44 uh, there's a translation issue that i talk about in the book where the Greek says, humes exu patru tu divalu. That is, Jesus says to the Jews, you are from the father of the devil. And in almost all English translations, in fact, all of them, they say you are from the father. You are of the father. Sorry. <laughs> you, the devil is your father, basically. Okay. Whereas the Greek can be read, I think, to say something different, that you are from the devil's father. Okay, and so that, that's a, that's, that's actually quite yeah that's a quite a an important difference. Okay, yeah. so then the then the question would then be who who is the devil's father? Mm. You really don't have a lot of options for this one because, uh, I mean, <laughs> the devil has a father, and uh, who would be the creator, because the creator makes. Lucifer and then Lucifer falls and becomes the devil. So yeah. the devil's father is, is, is still the is still the creator. So if Jesus says, as I think it's more correct to translate, that the Jews are from the father of the devil, they are they are saying that, or Jesus is saying what they in a sense wanted to think, that is, they are children of the creator. But in Jesus' rendition, the creator is father of the devil too. And it turns out that the evil traits of the devil, which include lying and murder, mm. as you see in John 8, 44, are also the traits of the creator. Now, the devil really, I mean, the devil is Jesus's enemy, but the opponent in John 8, 44 is, is the devil's father. And in John, you can see why this would make sense that Jesus actually comes to against the creator, because in John, it's very clear that Jesus doesn't follow the creator's law. That is, I mean, he, he goes out of his way to like heal on the Sabbath and to annoy the Jews about, you know, their, their regulations. But this is really a, an issue theologically about, you know, Jesus rejecting Jewish law. And if he rejects Jewish law, then he rejects the author of Jewish law. And who's the author of Jewish law? Well, it's the creator. And who's the creator? Well, he's been defined as the devil's father. Why is that? Because father and son are similar. They're both liars and murderers. So you can, you can 
get negative demiurgy out of John, particularly John 844. You can also get it out of later, uh, you can also get it out of later uh, texts from John where uh, Jesus talks about his adversary and whom, a being whom he calls the ruler of this world. He says, the ruler of this world is being driven out. And the ruler of this world will be judged. This is what he says later in the, his farewell discourse. And then the question is, well, who is the ruler of this world? Well, logically, I mean, most, I mean, most Christians want to say today that that's Satan, but is it from John's perspective that Satan is the ruler of the world? Wouldn't it be more logical to say that it's actually the creator who's the ruler of this world because the creator made this world or made the material aspects of it? And then, of course, you have the problem of, well, yeah, what did the creator actually make? Because it's the word who is supposed to have all things made through him. So how do you figure that out? And then this becomes a debate um, with Heraclian, uh, who's our first, very first commentator on John, trying to solve that problem. And I've got an episode on Heraclian on, on my Patreon, uh, for those of you who are interested. But that's a side note. To just, so just to answer your question, yes, absolutely. John 844, correctly translated and understood, is absolutely key for early Christians understanding the Judean ruler, let's call him, as an evil being who lies and ultimately kills Jesus himself. Could that fit in the context of Revelation 22, 16 to a point? Because if he's dodging the creator's laws, if some of the gospel material portrays Jesus in that light, could that have influenced Revelation, the offer of Revelation to, to link Jesus to the morning star? Well, that's an excellent question. My understanding of the author of Revelation is that he's the kind of Christian who wants ultimately to obey that law. If you look at the early chapters of Revelation 2 and 3, the author is most violently opposed to any Christian group, one of them being the so-called Nicolaitans, and you can learn more about them on my Patreon as well. But he, he criticizes the, like, the Nicolaitans by saying that they eat meat sacrificed to idols and that they commit pornea, which just, I mean, means fornication, but what exactly is meant by that spiritually or literally, I, I, I don't know. But these are classic Old Testament sins, you know, so, so whoever is writing the prophet or the seer that is writing Revelation is very much concerned to, first of all, encourage Christians to obey those Jewish laws, those anti-idolatry codes, and he's very also concerned to promote what might be called an Old Testament picture of God okay because let's face it I mean the God of Revelation is is looks frankly even more violent than the God of Genesis or the God of Exodus I mean he's he's willing to not just wipe out the world with a flood he's willing to torture and kill yeah. billions of people with a series of other plagues which wreak havoc so whoever that author of Revelation is is definitely advancing that picture of deity, which is something that Marcion and any thinking Christian of the early second century would be very hesitant to accept wholesale. And we gotta, again, we have to wait until the fourth century for revelation really to be undisputed integrated into the canon. Could Revelation 22, 16, John 8, 4, 4, John 10, 30, Matthew 1, 18, which combined, I know that John 8, 4, 4 is a bit iffy, as we, as you uh, mentioned earlier, but the other, the other 
three, Revelation 22, 16, John 10, Verde, Matthew 1, 18 combined, uh, identifies the Holy Spirit, God, and Lucifer as the parents of Jesus and, uh, and these have variations. But under both circumstances, an early Gnostic could see that as being the same person, the Holy Spirit, God, Lucifer, or Satan, and Jesus. And uh, the, so the same moment ago, the same, as the same person, could that have played, could that have also played a part in the creation of early Gnosticism? And could it actually have created another hypothetical sect, perhaps, that actually believed that God was not only his own father, but was a devil himself simultaneously in a situation like the Kabbalion principle of polarity? Well, again, that's a really interesting question. And my goal as a historian is to make sure that we're faithful to the very, oftentimes very different world of the early period. So first and second century, it's a whole different world with a whole different understanding of reality and a whole different set of questions and practices which are unfamiliar today. So when we today combine a bunch of New Testament texts, like from Matthew or from Revelation or from John, it assumes a modern canonical approach to the, the, the scriptures, basically. Mm -hmm. And the really radical point that, that needs to be understood is that canon does not exist. And it really doesn't exist officially until the late fourth century. There are books that are read in churches and those books are different depending on the ecclesial circle that you have. So the question of would early Christians like Marcion or Valentinus or Vasilides, would they be able to combine these, at their time, free-floating, non-authoritative, sometimes highly disputed texts, weave them together and combine them in such a way as to derive a theological point? Well, my answer would be basically no, they're not able to do that. They don't have the capability to do that because they're not thinking canonically. And they're not thinking canonically because they don't have a canon, or at least the one that survives today. Okay, so the other thing to keep in mind is that I mean, we have a lot of interesting readings of individual texts that some of which did end up in the New Testament, okay? Absolutely. But in none of them do we have the kind of theological leg legwork that you were pointing to. Um, mm -hmm. Christians were, just as they are today, completely antithetic to combining Satan and God and Jesus in any way, shape, or form. Um, and they, at least to themselves, wanted to keep Satan in his own category, which was difficult because, you know, he's just an angel who, who falls. So he's supposed to be good, and they don't really understand exactly how he became evil and exactly who's running this world. And so there's all disputes about that. But yeah, the short answer to your question, and feel free to ask more, but the, the short answer to your question is they're unable to make that kind of combination and then that kind of theological 
result simply because they don't, they're not reading Matthew and John and Revelation together. Could um, could the Jews, could, could some Jews after the destruction of the second temple and even after the Bar Kokhba revolt ended, um, and, and, that, and that of course happened in the early second century uh, AD, um, could they have, could some of them have been influenced to become Gnostic because of what happened? All, Yahweh promised us that we would win the war. It didn't work and things aren't going so well. So maybe somebody like, so maybe some of these Gnostics have a point or maybe Marcion has a point. Do you think some of that could have taken place? Well, it's a very old theory. It goes back to Robert Grant in the 1950s, maybe even earlier, where the argument was that there was such a psychological crisis amidst Jews that more or less some Jewish intellectuals simply flipped and polarized from love of the Jewish deity to hatred of the Jewish deity, okay. And the reality is you could imagine a situation in which that's plausible, but there just isn't any evidence, right? So the, to give an example, there are two very important Jewish works that are written fairly soon after the destruction of the temple in 70. And those Jewish works are 4th Ezra and 2nd Baruch. And both are present prophets as pleading with the Jewish deity and asking why the temple was destroyed. But in no case are they ever really critical of the Jewish deity himself. And when you look at today, and even in modern apologetics, it's very rare, I should say, for someone based on their social situation to completely flip and one day love Jesus and the other day hate Jesus because they can't find a job or or whatever. Now, it's not impossible, okay, uh, and, and I'm sure it, it's, it's happened, but as in all things historical, we need evidence for the theory, and there doesn't seem to be strong evidence of that. In fact, the Jews double down hmm. with the apologetics, and the classic argument is it was our fault. And you see this time and time again throughout history. It's never God's fault. Humans must have done something wrong. You know? Same thing with Bar Kokhba and the revolt on the Trajan. The Jews suffered. The Jews were basically annihilated in Alexandria. Almost. But you never hear them Blaming Yahweh, okay? Now, for those who weren't invested, you know, from those looking at it from afar, like Marcion, who's, you know, got no, not, no investment in Judea, and in the 130s, late, you know, mid-130s, mid when Rome completely destroys Judea, raises every town, every little village, in their hunt for Bar Kokhba, who's buried himself in tunnels and mountain fortresses. The Romans destroy everything and don't even let Jews enter Jerusalem for the next 200 years. That's a national catastrophe such as the world has never seen. And yet, Marcion, looking at this in his lifetime, may possibly have come to theological conclusions, but most of the Christians at the time, that is Gentile Christians, used the Bar Kokhba revolt not to say that the Jewish city is evil, 
but to say that the Jews were wrong and they're to blame for persecuting Christians and ultimately for killing Jesus. And that's a horrible argument to make, but that is the argument that they made. <laughs> And it's a, it's, it's a terrible blemish on Christian history that Christians took advantage of the horrible Jewish disasters. But in no case does it seem that Jews themselves or Gentile Christians were convinced that the creator was evil because of these actions. At least we don't have firm evidence of that. What they were doing was what modern Christians still do today and modern Gnostics still do today. That is, they were just reading their Bibles. And that was enough to convince them that the character of the Jewish deity was evil. And that was it. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.